<laughs> hey, everybody. Um, so thanks for dealing with a couple of technical issues. But um, uh, my name is Brian Stinson. I work on CentOS Stream for my day job. Um, and I'm here with uh, Josh Boyer, who does RHEL for his day job. And uh, we're here to talk a little bit about uh, CentOS Stream and how we use it, uh, you know, both within Red Hat to, to get day-to-day uh, -day work done for RHEL maintainers, but then also uh, talk a little bit about what you can do uh, to participate in, because uh, that's that's one of our whole goals of the uh, the CentOS stream as a deliverable uh, coming out of the project. So if you think of how things looked before CentOS stream, um, you know, take yourself back a, a few years, patches and features and all of that stuff would go into Fedora first, and then uh, you know magic would happen, and we would uh, branch for the uh, different versions of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And, you know, you would notice uh, things show up uh, from time to time in Fedora first and then, you know, backports and, and all that stuff. The things that Red Hat is good at uh, would show up in RHEL. And then later on, uh, you know, later on in the process, you would get source code that was dropped to CentOS and we would rebuild it and do some other things. And that turned out not to be a uh, uh, particularly useful for uh, like bug reporting and, and all of that stuff because the feedback cycle was way too long. Like it would take a long time for you to actually notice a bug, get it filed, and then you know, you've know you got to basically go through this whole cycle uh, to, to actually affect something. If you're looking at you know this side of the, the screen, the, the rel and the CentOS interactions, and uh, that, that happens because you know Fedora is allowed to just kind of move on and uh, do some operating system innovations that may not necessarily apply uh, to uh, to RHEL or CentOS. Um, but we so we decided to to sort of make a change. And I know like most of you in the room are, are probably pretty familiar with uh, with what we decided to do. But um, during the the most recent uh, release of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, RHEL 9, uh, we we wanted to affect this flow. Uh, so you start in Fedora, the OS innovation happens, uh, but we bring CentOS Stream here sort of in the middle, like a, a midstream type of uh, of distribution. Uh, so Fedora is is there to, you know, long-term make the, the next major versions. And then there's a handoff period sort of here in the middle. And if you paid close attention, uh, during the RHEL 9 development cycle as we were, you know, heading on towards GA, you probably noticed a lot of packages showing up in the CentOS stream build system, uh, you know, way before we were even talking about general availability of RHEL. Um, and that's that's important because, you know, we've got a couple of other projects that that sort of help us with this, this handoff with Fedora ELN and a, a couple of things. But whenever we're ready to, to sort of... Uh, you know, start turning the cranks on a new major version of RHEL. Uh, the, the handover happens to CentOS Stream, and then RHEL maintainers take over uh, from a day-to-day a, a -day basis. Uh, so like RHEL 9 is now uh, the entire development process for the minor releases are affected through, through CentOS Stream. So if you think of, you know, the, the upcoming releases of uh, 9.1, 9.2, all of that stuff, it's a continuous cycle of RHEL maintainers doing their work out in the open. And so we kind of decided to, uh, to talk about that a little bit as, you know, you, you can think of it as the next minor version of RHEL that is visible to you, but it's also contributable. So, you know, one of the things that we did as part of the project was we fundamentally changed the way that RHEL maintainers were doing their work. The, the development of the next minor release doesn't happen inside of Red Hat anymore. It happens out in the CentOS Stream project. And, you know, that means uh, a couple of different things for us. Uh, first, it means we have to expose a little bit of our process, which is, you know, mostly okay, because that gives us the benefit of, uh, you know, accepting contributions and showing our work and making sure that we, uh, we produce some artifacts that are useful not just to Red Hat, but to the rest of us as, uh, as the wider community. And so uh, to talk a little bit about the flow of how this works, 
you know, I mentioned some, uh, you know, some internal implementation details. Uh, that's that's still the case. You know, rel maintainers still have to follow a lot of process in order to get uh, a package or a patch from, you know, development all the way into, uh, you know, something that's acceptable to build and then, uh, you know, push out into some of the various locations. And so everything really starts with a bugzilla. Uh, and if you're looking to make a change or uh, you notice a, uh, you know, something's not quite right, um, or if you want to add a feature like this one, um, I actually just picked this one from uh, was a couple of days ago. I saw the build come through last night, actually. Uh, but we wanted to add multipath TCP functionality to Network Manager. That seems like a good thing. Um, if you think back to the like to the old way of doing things, you would you may be able to see this bugzilla depending on you know how it was filed and all that stuff, but you wouldn't be able to you know see the code or uh, even try out a build until like way way late in the process, like maybe even six months from now. Um, but you know here you can see uh, we've got a, a bugzilla open, uh, and if you're interested in multipath TCP, uh, you can follow this. Uh, uh, this bug as it goes through and, and sort of get some uh, some interesting information about it. I think the the other thing too is you've got a few different fields that you can see. Uh, so when a build actually happens, you can you know sort of guess about which uh, which package version it's going to be fixed in and and stuff like that. And that's reflected to you as part of the build process. So here's a diagram of of kind of how things work. Uh, so the bugzilla happens first, but we've switched rel maintainers to doing a merge request workflow to uh, to affect the changes that are going into the the next minor release. And so you can see up top here is like the CentOS stream infrastructure, the uh, the uh, code repositories and build system that we have. It's sort of parallel to what happens internally. We do that for a couple of reasons, which. Um, aren't really interesting. We can talk about it uh, over coffee or something like that. But uh, there's a number of, uh, of processes that we have in place to keep them in sync. And so there's a merge request. You can see it's, it starts up here. Um, and there's a, a little bit of uh, extra testing that happens on the merge request itself. And it you know, kind of checks, it, checks out some of the, the rel process that we have to, the, the paperwork that we have to fill out in Bugzilla and other places. Uh, but it really starts when you merge that to the Git locations. And so if you think of our, our uh, multipath TCP example, here's the merge request. And this, uh, this was open you know, pretty recently, and uh, this is on gitlab.com. Uh, you can see the, uh, the, the location there in the CentOS stream namespace. This is targeting you know, the, the next minor release. Merge request was opened. Uh, a couple of patches were made. You can see the details of, uh, you know, what all was changed against the RPM spec files, or if they uploaded a new uh, set of sources or something like that. That's all available to, uh, to you to see what they did. But uh, so this merge request was merged, and if you look back at our diagram again, we're we're actually about here uh, at this point in the process. The merge request was merged. The maintainer at, can kick off a build in the stream infrastructure, and it's actually um, these are actually kept in sync by automation. So a build happens in the stream infrastructure, and then if you were to look uh, sort of inside Red Hat, there's a build that happened there. And what that happens, uh, what that allows us to do, uh, is is a couple of things. It's internally we have to actually verify and test on the bits that rel is actually going to ship, and so that's part of this this procedure here. And if I, I think if you look out at that network manager version out there right now, uh, it's it's actually still stuck in in rel gating. Uh, that's our uh, you know some of our test procedures and and stuff like that, um, but. If if all, all goes well, all the tests pass, and uh, you know maintainers and, and QE are happy with it. Uh, you know things move on to a, a couple of different tags, and the naming structure between them is maintained the same. So if you have an internal view of our uh, our brew tag structure, we have the gate tag, 
which you know means that we're waiting on some some test results. We have the candidate tag, which means the build is past testing, and then the pending tag, which is when it's ready for uh, for release. And you can think of this green box here for verification. That's all uh, implementation details for for rel process and stuff. But that's all reflected on the build itself. So here's the network manager build in uh, the, the stream Koji. Uh, if you were to scroll down on this, this screen a little bit, you'd see those, those different tags and be able to tell about just about where it is in, in the entire process. And it, it, it's, it's actually pretty neat because uh, you can go out there and download this from the build system itself. Uh, once it actually makes it past a couple of different places, as soon as it lands in the candidate tag, uh, we have a number of um, of development composes. So you, you can think of a compose as like the uh, how the repositories would look at a point in time. You can actually pull those development composes once it's past the you know the proper uh, gating and and all of that stuff. This build will actually make it in there. We run those almost nightly. Uh, there's you know infrastructure things and uh, sometimes stuff happens to be broken in terms of. Uh, you know, not being able to complete one. But those are available uh, basically as soon as this package passes gating. They make it into a development compose, and then if they're ready, they uh, they make it into one of our production ones that we end up pushing out to the mirrors and, and stuff like that. Um, so this was a, like, this was a particularly interesting change uh, because, you know, someone was interested in multipath TCP they opened a bugzilla. Uh, they were uh, they worked with their rel maintainers to you know talk about a patch. The patch was applied, and a build is available in the public. And you know once the uh, once the work was actually accepted, this you know this happened in a pretty uh, pretty tight time frame. It's no longer like six months or two years or you know anything like that. It's pretty pretty awesome actually. But there's um, there's a couple of considerations because we're we're in a little bit of a phase right now. Um, if you think back, you know, maybe uh, a, a few months, you know, a, a year or so, um, it was uh, we were working on the the major release of Rel nine, and right now we're actually focusing on future minor releases of Rel nine, and that has some uh, some implications for the types of contributions that we want to accept. And so I'm going to hand it over to Josh, and he's going to talk a little bit about all of that stuff. All, all of that stuff. All right. You guys can hear me OK? OK. Um, so the types of contributions. So we just had RHEL 9 GA in May. Uh, before GA happened, it was, it was a little bit of a wild west. Like We could accept all kinds of contributions because we were heavy in development. We had been working on RHEL 9 for, I don't know, two years at least uh, leading up to it, because starting with the RHEL 8 release, we publicly said we're going to do six-month minor releases, and we're going to do three-year major releases. So it's out there. People know about when we start. When Stream 9 came online, that's when it was open. We got lots of contributions from our, our friend Neil in the back there. He, uh, he helped us shape what is in uh, one of our repositories called Code Ready Builder, or CRB. Um, Carl also continues to advocate for things uh, on behalf of Apple and, and other country, uh, contributors. But the point here is, before the major release is the time where it is most flexible, right? We'll put it that way. Uh, and the reason it's, it's most flexible is because we actually, uh, at GA, have promises that we make to Red Hat customers for RHEL that cover things like ABI guarantees, support statements, et cetera, et cetera. Stuff you would expect for an enterprise operating system. Um, after GA, things like bug fixes are most welcome. Uh, bug reports are always welcome at any point in time. Bug fixes are fantastic. So if you have a bug, you've looked at the code, you know how to fix it, you open a bug, and you submit a pull request with the fix, that is fantastic. We will look at it. We'll make sure that it kind of applies to our ABI checks, doesn't, doesn't break things that we expect uh, to customers to have uh, guarantees on, and if so, we can merge it, right? Um, 
stable updates from upstream. Stable here is in quotes because as RHEL gets older, uh, upstream is continuing to move further away from it. So we do more and more backporting. Some of our packages in RHEL will rebase to match upstream. Most of them don't. So when we say stable, we mean like RHEL enterprise quality stable uh, on, on updates from upstream. Uh, backported features. This one is really, in particular, kind of interesting. RHEL is not stagnant. We do add features every single release. Uh, and those, as Brian has uh, outlined, flow through CentOS Stream, show up there first. But most of them are backported. And if the feature is incompatible with something that uh, we can't do because of ABI reasons or things like that, we will politely explain why and probably reject it. Uh, if it is a feature we are not ready to support, then that might fall into something called tech preview uh, if we intend to support it long term. And it might say, well, we can't do it this release. Well, maybe we'll do it in the next release or something like that. Um, I would say for most of our features, especially if they're large kind of big changes, we would want you to kind of put those in Fedora first rather than stream. Uh, but we do take features all the time. So the one Brian highlighted in the example is a good one. Uh, eight, okay, so I've talked about ABI several several times. ABI incompatible rebases. Uh, we actually have a whole very long document that describes RHEL's ABI promises called, uh, called our application compatibility guidelines. If you want to, you can read it. The short version is most of RHEL's packages uh, and therefore CentOS Stream promise to have the same ABI for the entire life of that major release. So that's 10 years. Uh, that's a long time to guarantee an ABI. So we take it very seriously because customers and users build their applications. They want to build them once and they want it to run. They don't want to rebuild every single time. Now we do have packages that, that don't promise that ABI guarantee, but it is, it is a very small subset. So breaking ABI, please don't, please don't submit changes and, and request to do that because we'll have to politely say no. Um, this one is a question mark and I actually had to ask Brian why it was a question mark and he explained. So docs, man pages and typo fixes. Um, Actually, if, if you are a RHEL customer, you can go to the customer portal. And if you have a, a documentation bug that you find, you can there's a like a quick report issue uh, thing that will go directly to our documentation team. But uh, if you're not a RHEL customer, if you want to change the docs and submit doc changes, we can certainly take those. They might not get reflected immediately, uh, but we'll look at them and, and our docs writers will kind of triage and help you work through like grammar and if the change is actually necessary, et cetera, et cetera. Man pages and typo fixes, these are always like the canonical things that people want to see fixed. Um, it's not that we don't want to see them fixed, it's that we tend to batch them up. Uh, so it won't, it, like all the maintainers are busy doing other work and I'll actually, I, we have a slide coming up that kind of illustrates this, but uh, their focus on actual like code fixes, the man pages uh, and the typo fixes, as long as they're not actually causing problems, and it's just a reading comprehension thing or you know something in the man page we backported, we forgot to add it to the man page. That stuff will get queued up and, and kind of batched and done towards a, a different release when the maintainer has time. So it's not that we don't take them, it's just that it might not land as you would expect it to for such a small trivial fix. All right. Yeah, so we, um, it, we talked a little bit earlier about that, uh, that network manager fix that's making its way through. I think we can, uh, can probably go through that again and just talk about how you, you can know what, like, what's going on with that package. Sometimes it's a little, bit, uh, uh, a little bit hard to find, but it actually makes a little bit of sense once you, you kind of get a, a feel for, for everything. Um, yeah, here's the, uh, the fuller page, and I guess I pulled this earlier this morning. Uh, you can see that the network manager fixes in the CNNS gate uh, package, or uh, the CNNS gate tag, I mean. Um, so, yeah, this is the uh, the full location. And again, you can you can download all of this stuff if you're interested in actually installing this on your system, you know, just by hand or something, or if you want to test it out. Um, but again, uh, CNNS gate, waiting for rel gating, uh, CNNS a candidate waiting for rel verification. That's a, an internal process that the subsystem teams go through to uh, uh, to kind of do a, a secondary layer of testing and then fill out more paperwork. There's plenty of paperwork in the rel process, to be honest. But um, the uh, after that, the CNNS pending tag is really um, 
one of the one of the ones that you'll want to pay attention to because that's the stuff that makes it out to uh, to the mirrors at some point. And so if uh, if a package is in CNNS pending and you don't see it on the mirrors yet, you're likely to find it uh, in the next uh, push that we do. And we typically do those uh, around weekly, depending on the health of uh, of the composers at the time. And uh, Josh, you had a yeah, comment. Yeah, I was just going to say, so you mentioned development composers earlier yep, in the slide. That's right. So C9S candidate, so things that have passed gating, that's where the development pos composers come from. So if you're paying attention to that package and you see it's in the candidate tag, go look for a development compose if you yep. really want to kind of pull that down as a as a unit. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, um, there, there's a number of steps along the way during the process for uh, for making all this stuff happen and making it show up on the on the stream mirrors, and uh, we we talked about a few of them. Uh, you know, uh, teams may be busy in the middle of uh, you know looking at if a package is stuck in the gate tag, they may be looking at some of the the tests that they need to refactor in order to uh, to get their automated uh, uh, test suites to be in a little bit more shape. Uh, if it's stuck here in the in the candidate tag, you know the uh, I think the teams have uh, sometimes they get some uh, some pretty big backlogs for things like verification and and other things that are going on internal to Red Hat. But even if you see a bugzilla sitting out there for uh, for a little bit of time, um, you know don't assume that that it's just sitting there necessarily. Uh, we do actually review those. Uh, the, and the teams actually review those uh, quite regularly, and they pay attention to the the, the cues that they have in in those systems. Um, I think to give you a little bit of uh, of a window into what rel maintainers are dealing with, I thought maybe we could look at uh, how the the life cycles of rel line up. And I'm going to toss this over to Josh to talk a little bit about uh, sort of a day in the life of a maintainer and what, kind of what they're doing. Uh, and how they're spending their time split across a number of uh, of activities. Yeah, so this is for RHEL 9. Uh, this is our six month minor release. You can see the bold blue chunks uh, are six months. That's every minor release we do. Uh, but then the light blue ones and then the longer uh, light green ones, that's actually uh, extended update support and support services for SAP. So when we do a minor release, uh, it's not, yay, we're done, and now we can move on to the next one. It's, yay, we're done, now we have to support it for up to four more years, just that specific minor release. Um, the thing that we're not showing is this is just RHEL 9. The same diagram and the same semantics apply to RHEL 8, and then we also still support RHEL 7. All the same maintainers are working across all three major releases at this point. So needless to say, they're very busy. Um, they have to prioritize their time, figure out where it goes. So on the next slide... These arrows pointing backwards, that's when we actually start the work for the minor release. And that's usually where CentOS Stream comes in uh, when contributions come in. So as you're looking to, to land changes, if you're looking to see it in CentOS Stream, you can almost ignore this because Stream just continues on. And just know that somewhere along the way, when we're doing our, our development for RHEL, we will look at your contribution, say, yes, it's acceptable, we're going to pull it in. And when it lands in stream, it should show up in whatever next block uh, it, it happens to be cor corresponding to. Now, if you're looking for it from a, I want to contribute to stream so I can see when it shows up into rel, this one's a little bit more important because you need to know approximately based on that six month boundary, like we're working on it well in advance. So if you want to get it into say rel 9.4, you can look at this diagram and kind of try to line it up, get your submission in early, it might show up in 9.2, 9.3, 9.4, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so again, only what you see is RHEL 9 here, but we've got 8, 7. Uh, I think we even have an ELS program for RHEL 6 at this point. So, Yep. And if you're looking for, um, if you're looking to contribute features for like uh, far future minor releases too, those are absolutely acceptable. Uh, we, we don't really make that distinction out in the public. Like there's there's no real... Uh, there's no real way to communicate that information, you know, really clearly to uh, to public contributions. But the teams themselves are actually prioritizing that and figuring out amongst the rest of their priorities about which, like, which release they can go uh, that can go in. And that's a conversation to have uh, on the Bugzilla with the maintainers that are working on each package. Um, so, I think with that. 
Um, you know, uh, I think it's interesting to talk about what you can use Stream for and what's the most productive activity uh, that, that makes sense for you, but also uh, to fit in with the sort of the rest of the process here. Uh, the, the main thing is to try features that are in development. Multipath TCP is a great example um, because it gives you a little bit of exposure early and you can, uh, you know, test your own workloads against it. You can, uh, you know, file bugs if something doesn't quite fit what you expected out of, uh, out of a feature request. And this stuff happens early. Like this is, uh, that's the, uh, sort of the main feature of, of this whole process is you can try this stuff out, uh, in the beginning. Uh, you can file bug reports and submit patches if you're um, uh, if you like doing that sort of thing. It's uh, it's a pretty contributable process. Um, you uh, uh, make sure to to file a bugzilla first. I think most of our documentation uh, covers that as the, sort of the entry point because you want to start a conversation with your your maintainers there. Uh, and then any uh, if you're a project. Uh, that builds on top of RHEL, and you, you want to see what's coming next. You want to make sure that you verify against future versions, uh, you know, all of that. This, uh, Stream is a great uh, thing to pull into your automated testing systems. And you can get uh, bits in a, a number of different ways. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But um, just a, a sort of a, a canary of what's coming in future releases is pretty great to have uh, for projects that build on top of RHEL because that lets you uh, that's, that lets you kind of manage the the differences from one minor release to to another. And then, of course, if you're uh, if you're part of the CentOS project, you're familiar with our special interest groups. Uh, Stream is a first class citizen in the community build system, so you've got build roots that can build against all of the active CentOS Stream releases. Uh, and you can actually release your uh, your content in uh, a special interest group built on top of Stream. Uh, so Stream users who have it on your, you know, if you put Stream on your laptop, uh, which is, uh, I have it on that one, but we had some, you know, technical difficulties and, and all that stuff. But, um, but you can put Stream on your laptop and, you know, try it out day to day and also get content from the special interest groups that are, is, uh, is interesting. So what is, uh, what is Stream not really suited for? I, I think it's important to cover what we're not trying to, uh, to do as, as part of the, uh, the deliverables here. Um, the, for the artifacts that we produce, we maintain a few packages on the mirrors for uh, you know, backwards compatibility. If you look at the composers, like I said, those are point in time releases and they only have one version of uh, the latest version of each package that we know about for that compose type. Um, so if you want to do any like long-term pinning or, uh, you know, you, you really care about one particular version of a package, that's something that you'll have to create for yourself. That's not something that we, we really do as a, um, as a goal here. Uh, CentOS Stream is not really for productization or certification of RHEL itself. Uh, we've got processes that happen internally for that. So, um, I, I think that's that's sort of reflected in the two different build systems that we coordinate on sort of along the same path. Uh, internally, whenever we uh, we productize and certify RHEL, we do it on RHEL bits. And so uh, if there's, I don't know if, if many of you in the room here, um, you know, know much about that process, but if you do, uh, you'll want to talk with your RHEL contacts to make sure that you're, you're working on RHEL bits. And uh, since CentOS Stream is now ahead of, uh, uh, of the RHEL process, uh, so we do put security fixes in as part of, you know, just as they come in for, um, for development purposes. Uh, and we, we do try to get security fixes in just, you know, for the, uh, the bare fact that they also affect the next minor version of RHEL. But we don't provide CVE metadata because that's uh, that's part of the process that happens uh, when we actually go to to release rel itself. And every bug is sort of treated more like a bug fix in stream than a security fix. And we don't really um, uh, we don't really recommend any sort of security pinning or or anything like that. 
that's that's true for future uh, uh, for um, uh, previous versions of CentOS as well. You always want to make sure that you have the the latest up to date packages as a whole, rather than trying to pick individual security updates and and stuff like that. Uh, so, yeah, what can you do now? Open Bugzilla's. Uh, put stream on your laptop. Make sure that it works for you. But we we do actively look at at every Bugzilla that comes in and make sure that it it gets triaged to the right place and uh, and stuff like that. If you notice a bug, uh, that's a great way to start a conversation with the maintainers of of each package. Uh, create a GitLab account. So GitLab.com. Uh, you can uh, you can actually sign up through. I think you can sign up through the Fedora account system and or the CentOS account system now and, and sort of get access to some of that stuff. But if you already have a gitlab.com account, uh, that's that's how you're going to uh, fork the individual repos and uh, submit your merge requests. That's a great thing to do too. Um, especially if you have that, that Bugzilla open and you know how to fix a particular bug. And the final recommendation, um, so I know that we uh, we publish all of this stuff out to the mirrors on a regular basis. Um, and I think that's an important uh, way that that we actually deliver CentOS Stream as a as a project. But really, if you want um, if you want to follow things in your continuous integration system, or if you you know just want to uh, to point at something that updates a little bit more frequently, uh, go to composes.stream.centos.org. That has our different compose types, our development composes, our production composes that we end up pushing to the mirrors at some point. Uh, that's going to be um, uh, a really good resource for you to get the latest and greatest. And I know there's been some questions in the past about, um, you know, can the infrastructure handle all of that, you know, that sort of thing. We We kept that in mind whenever we designed uh, the system here. So composes.stream is absolutely okay to point against uh, if you want the latest and greatest. So with that, are there any questions? What, one more quick point. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, you've got the RHEL guy standing up here. This is a CentOS dojo. We talked a lot about RHEL in our CentOS stream talk. Uh, it's not that RHEL is the center of the universe. We actually internally kind of equate them to be the same thing. Uh, in terms of like how we do the development. And we really do mean that. Like we mean CentOS Stream as a development space for RHEL. And so talking about them almost synonymously is natural for us, but that is a little confusing for people who aren't necessarily used to RHEL being as open as it is today. Okay, now questions. I think right now it's it's kind of difficult to know where things are, and I've done the process of the sky of digging through code yeah. to figure out where things are at. Yeah. But I think unless you're like deeply invested in the project, it's pretty difficult. So I think some kind of like waterfall style dashboard where you could see your packages here. Yeah. Would probably make it a lot easier for people also to see the progress in the project. Y in the yeah. So the the suggestion was to uh, go ahead. Sean, do you want us to repeat the question? For the for the people on the stream, yeah, well, we can repeat that. Uh, so the uh, I think the question, the comment was, um, it, it's the um, uh, gate candidate pending the the status of a package is um, a little bit difficult to understand if you're first coming in and, and don't know what's going on. And I think that's a that's a fair point. Um, right now, we don't have any engineering work planned. I know there's some. Uh, like all of that stuff is described in the documentation that we have for the contributor guide. And I think highlighting that is probably going to be uh, one of the first steps that we should take for, you know, kind of surfacing that process. Um, doing some sort of uh, like a visualization or, or something like that, that's something we could consider in the future. Uh, but we don't have uh, engineering work, uh, but we don't have uh, engineering work planned on that, anything like that yet. Troy. Yeah. It, yeah. So Troy's point was that uh, uh, all of that stuff is publicly visible in the build system and and all of that stuff. And there are a number of ways you can you could get that information and and sort of 
uh, write a tool that that tells you that for yourself if you're interested. Yeah. What the, the place where it gets stuck probably for the longest amount of time is in that gating area. Yep. And just to elaborate a little bit on what happens there. So internally, we have a number of CI CD checks for every package that goes through RHEL. Uh, and when that happens, like we, we do things like make sure the spec file can build, uh, do Anna check, do some scanning of code uh, for Coverity, things like that. Then each team that maintains a package can add their own tests on top of it. And so like that's why uh, you have some that, that are fairly simple packages that kind of don't take that long to go through gating. And then you have some like the kernel that do you have some like the kernel that take days, right? Uh, GCC is another one where the build itself takes a very long time and then getting on top of that takes even longer. So it's just, it's not that it's a black box. It's just that it's variable in terms of what the teams have actually implemented in the gating. Yeah. Right, the and, uh, yeah. So the, the question is, is, is the, uh, is gating exposed, is, is rel gating exposed somewhere? Uh, yeah, the answer is no. Um, one of the reasons is we, like some uh, some teams actually go as far as uh, you know putting like Red Hat partner tests and you know internal stuff that uh, that actually votes on their uh, the gating result there, and so we don't want to necessarily expose uh, you know partner relationship type of uh, of material out to the public. But um, but I think the um, the other point too is if you're confused about a package, you know. We're, I think one of the things that we're trying to encourage by talking so much about RHEL process too is like the RHEL maintainers are part of this whole community and they're accessible for you to uh, to work with on the bugzillas and you know uh, don't go uh, you know herd them all at once but the, they're happy to uh, to sort of triage and answer questions as well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> that's that's a good question. Uh, the question was, uh, with the uh, sort of with the change in in focus to uh, being a midstream uh, rather than a downstream, what was the uh, the biggest surprise and the biggest challenge? Um, I think uh, I, I think the biggest surprise to me was how smoothly we were able to communicate a new workflow for you know a thousand people. Well, we got a thousand people who were used to just pushing directly to a, a Git branch and doing their, their build internally. We converted all of those folks over to a merge request workflow as part of this, just because it was necessary, but that's also a better experience and a more accessible experience if you're looking to communicate uh, contribute from the outside. So that was pretty cool to see. Um, the, uh, the biggest challenge, do you wanna take a, what were you surprised by, Josh? Um. I was surprised we didn't do it sooner, if I'm being honest. Not because uh, it was easy to do, because the, the stream team that put everything together put a ton of work in, but because the feedback loop aspect of it is the potential for it is so much better than the way we did it before. Uh, and so I, I really do encourage people to use stream and give us that feedback as much as possible, because that's only going to kind of double down on our investment there. Yep. And I think the um, so the biggest challenge from from my perspective, uh, and I'm gonna like I'm gonna speak to the the mechanics of actually making this happen, um, is like finding the dividing line between what is necessarily internal because of like product concerns or or customer and partner concerns versus like how much can we take and and expose out to the public. That was a that was a really tough question to deal with as we were actually making this happen on an engineering level. Um, and I think it's uh, it, we've got a pretty good start. And uh, this is not the not the end of some of that work that we're we're looking to do with the stream project. Yeah, I mean, just to kind of add to what Brian's saying, if you look at the diagram, you'll see that we're doing mirrored development essentially, right? And it's, there's a lot of automation in place. So like we do a build in CentOS stream and then it automated, automatically does a build internally. That actually gets in the way of some of the efficiency that you could get if that build that we did in CentOS stream was somehow viable for a product, right? Um, and there's a lot of 
supply chain reasons why we do it this way. And, you know, we have, we have actual compliance that we have to adhere to, but we're always looking to, to kind of take that parallel development path and make them be the same development path as early as we can. That way we don't have multiple binary artifacts and things like that. Now, that's not a promise that we're going to do that, but we're continually looking at ways to improve that. Uh, yeah, th that's a good uh, that's a good question. So the uh, the question was, how do we expect to see this process uh, evolve in the future? Um, I think one of the things that uh, one of the things that I'd like to see, and I know there's a lot of work that's happening out in the the Fedora and upstream communities, um, the the contribution aspect. If you notice, and you go out actually go out to the GitLab repos, it's very very RPM focused, and it's very very focused on the disk git format that we've, we know and love for, you know, decades at this point. Um, I think one of the, one of the things that I, I'd be interested to see is like, how do we actually surface the changes that we're making to the code itself? Uh, not necessarily the code itself, plus the, you know, the packaging format changes that we need to make. But um, sometimes that can be a little bit opaque. I don't think that there's gonna be, um, uh, other than that, like I think the the theme is, uh, like I said, continuing to to take what we can uh, as you know the the day to day processes that we go through for our day jobs and then for uh, as a contributor and uh, make that as public as we can as early as we can. Any questions from the internets? Awesome. Well, thanks for letting us speak with you today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the dojo.